Great. We'll go ahead and get started. Thank you all for coming. There may still be a few more people joining us, but um, I'll keep an eye on the door and let them in when they arrive. Um, I want to introduce myself for those of you who don't know me. My name is Valerie Nye. I'm the library director here at Santa Fe Community College. And I'm really looking forward to this conversation this evening with Michael McGarity, and I know you all are too. Again, I'm gonna ask everybody to stay muted until we get to the Q&A section. And um, I may mute you. So if you see that sign come up, um, we're just trying to avoid distractions, barking dogs and that kind of thing. So um, trying to keep the background noise as small as possible. It's really my honor to introduce Michael McGarity this evening. Uh, Michael McGarity, along with being a writer, has been a supporter of libraries in New Mexico for a long time. He supported students and New Mexico writers, and I've been grateful personally to benefit from his support, both as a librarian and a writer. I just want to share a quick story about Michael McGarity and his support. A friend of mine, Kathy Barco, who's here this evening, and I wrote a book uh, that was published in 2006 called Breakfast Santa Fe Style. It was our first book ever, and we had a, a book signing at the Vista Grande Public Library in El Dorado. We had a nice number of people come out, but one of the most special people who came was Michael McGarity. He came to show his support for us as new writers, and um, he shared his wisdom and enthusiasm with us, which was really valuable at the time. And he also gave us some really great marketing advice, which we have taken forward into other book projects together. Michael McGarity is the author of 17 published works. His most recent published mystery is Head Wounds, and it's the book that ended the Kevin Kearney series. I know from talking to him that he's now hard at work on a brand new series and is working on deadline currently to get it to his publisher in April. And just knowing that he's working on this really focused deadline, I'm even more grateful that he's taken some time this evening to talk to all of us. So please help me welcome Michael McGarity. Uh, let me get you unmuted here real quick. Yeah, am I there you go. All okay. right, yep, yeah, that's great. Right. I'm a, go ahead, thank you. I'm a tech idiot, actually. But before I get into what I'm going to talk about, I have to tell everybody in the audience how wonderful this woman is. Val is the personification of what a library director should be. And the job she does at the community college, and before that, when she was at IAIA, and before that, when she was at the College of Santa Fe, she's one of a kind. And she personifies to me everything that I love about librarians. Uh, they're some of my favorite people. So. Val, I'm delighted to do this with you tonight. With that said, let me start with a brief little story. Many years ago, when my debut novel, Tula Rosa, published, I was walking down a Fifth Avenue, I was walking down Fifth Avenue in New York City on my way to visit my publisher, and I glance in a bookstore window. And there was a copy of Tula Rosa, my first novel. I literally floated the rest of the way down Fifth Avenue. It was so exhilarating. And even when I tell that little tale right now, it's still, I can still feel those goosebumps. And I tell you that because I would wish this for all of you. I would wish all of you to have this experience because it's one of those once in a lifetime deals. Okay, with that said, now I'm going to start talking about all the roadblocks that are in your way. But I wanted to preface it with my hope that you too could achieve something remarkable as writers. So first of all, let's talk about creative arts. 
There are dancers, there are singers, there are musicians, there are actors, there are writers, there are painters, there are sculptors. There are these multitude of creative people in the world <clears throat> who are trying to find a way to get their art out into the world. <clears throat> now, I suppose if you're a musician, uh, you can rent a concert hall and put on a concert. I suppose if you're a painter or a sculptor, uh, you could open a gallery or you could rent gallery space to show your work. I suppose if you're an actor, uh, you could make a YouTube and put it out in the world. Uh, if you're a musician, you could also produce a CD and get it out there for people to hear. You could do all of that. And as a, verse, as a writer, you can self-publish, which I think is a very bad idea. And I'm gonna tell you why. I think it's almost in a way like giving up on yourself to do that. And I have known people with a certain amount of talent who have chosen to take that path. They've established their own private publishing company, if you will, and have published their novels that way. And then they go about the business of trying to market it. And let's face it, the reality is it literally doesn't go anywhere for most people. And it probably shouldn't. Now, why would I say that? Well, I say that because I think if you're a musician and you put out your CD, if you're a painter and you run a space, if you're a dancer and you choreograph a, a, a concert somewhere or whatever, it's the easy way out. And it's not a question of talent often. It's just a question of giving up. And so I am not a fan of the self-publishing world because I think I have read works by people who have a certain amount of ability and have stopped short of challenging themselves and decided to go that route. Now, what is it? What happens to people? I know I faced an enormous amount of rejection, but I wasn't willing to give up on being rejected by establishment publishers. I just wasn't willing to give that up. Now, I knew there were other levels to publishing that I could pursue. I could go to small presses, I could go to university presses, I could go to regional presses, and then finally I could self-publish. No, I wanted to be rejected by everybody before that happened, whether it was a publisher or an agent or whatever. So, I guess you could say in a way I was, I, I was either, either obstinate or thick skinned or both, but I was determined not to stop short of trying to reach the goal that I had set for myself, which was to write a book that was good enough for a New York publishing firm to say yes. So you gotta be tough on rejection and you've got to persevere and you've got to not lower your sights. That's easy enough to say, sometimes very hard to do. Now, one of the things I have found with some budding writers is that they're too sure of their own talent. In other words, they've already decided they're better than everybody or a lot of people. And you know what? In some cases, they're not wrong. Because if you take a look at commercial fiction, if you take a look at genre, you can say, that's not a very good mystery. That's not a very good romance novel. That's not a very good memoir. That's not a very good narrative nonfiction book. I should be able to do better. The fact of the matter is, you have to actually demonstrate on the page that you can do better. And that is not an easy task. So it can be hard to face rejection. It can be easy to self-publish. It can be 
too much ego in thinking that you're far better than the multi-million dollar, a number one New York Times best-selling authors that have written 80 books, most of them bad, it can still get in your way. So I suggest that you have to look very clearly at yourself in terms of where your ego is involved with this. I once knew a man, and this was back when I was still struggling myself, and not talking about it to very many people because I thought that my writing that I was trying to do was a very private matter, who worked for the same government agency that I did and drove around in a car with a vanity license plate that said author. And he had never published a thing. And to this day, I don't think he has. But he was already determined that that was a title, if you will, that he deserved. Is that ego? Yes, that's ego. Is it good? No, it's not. What else? I hope you're all making notes. This is all very important stuff. You're not going to get this from a literary agent, a creative writing professor, or a publisher. You can be blinded to your fault, flaws. You can do certain things well as an artist and then not. Uh, let's take an example. Let's say that there is an artist who is extremely gifted at working in the medium of print, but not really very good when it comes to oil painting. All right, so the concentration for that person should be in their area of strength. Well, you can break it down further and you can talk about what it is that you know you can do well and, what it, and whether or not you have the clarity as an artist to see where you fall short. And then from there, decide to do something about it. I'll give you an example out of my experience. Starting out as a writer, uh, I could do certain things well. I was good at describing places. I was good at developing a character. I was not so good at the narrative arc. And I sucked at writing about women and writing good dialogue. Not good. I had to tough my way through that. And fortunately, my lady, Mimi, was my first reader. And she was able to come back at me and say, this doesn't work. And so I had a hard lesson to learn because I thought I was going along just fine. But I wasn't. So you've got to recognize flaws. And then you've got to say, am I willing to really deal with that in some sort of concentrated, focused way? All right, so we've covered what? One, two, three, four issues now. Let's go to number five, which is one of my favorites of all time. And you may not like this one. You can be blinded by your friends, your family, your fellow writers, and everybody else who praises your work simply because they love you. They want you to succeed. They hope that you succeed. They're so happy if you could succeed. And they are going to derail you with their compliments and play, praise. You don't want that kind of criticism. You don't. What you want is tough love. And that's hard to get from friends and lovers and families and members of your writing group. And it's probably hard not to give that if you're one of those people that are saying to your very dear best friend who's written 
a wonderful uh, historical novel that is just super when in your heart you know it is. So that can be a pitfall and can be a dangerous one because you're going to want to believe what they're telling you. And in truth, maybe you shouldn't. Maybe you should become above all things your harshest and best critic, which is not an easy thing to do. Okay, what else? I mean, this is a big list and I'm not through yet. You can give up on yourself and cave into the ordinary. What are you willing to sacrifice for your art? Are you willing to sacrifice anything? Are you willing to give up anything? Are you willing to set aside some comforts? Are you willing to get by with a little less money? Are you willing to take a little bit more risks? Are you willing to fight for a little bit more time to be able to try to polish and develop your craft? Or, or not? Because to me, the pursuit of creativity is not a money matter. It's a matter of who you are as a person and what you are trying to achieve for yourself within this thing we call a life. So there are a lot of people I know that I've met throughout the years that I saw as talented, as capable, as bright, as anybody out there in a particular creative field who basically folded, who folded. And I don't know whether you want to fold. That's a question that you have to ask yourself and you have to look at it very critically. Next. Don't follow all the advice you get, even including tonight from me. Uh, whether it's a creative writing class, whether it's a community college workshop, whether it's your first reader, whether it's editors who are telling you what to do and what not to do, you've got to have some sort of confidence and trust in yourself. I mean, that's got to be the core of why you're drawn to this in the first place. Next, forget about formulas. Please don't sit down to say, I wanna write a mystery. Please don't sit down to say, I wanna write a romance novel. Please don't sit down and say, I wanna write historical fiction. Don't do that to yourself. Don't put yourself in that tight little constricted category. What you wanna do is tell a story. Figure out where it goes after you've done that, not before. If you do it before, you're locking yourself into a formula because you've read 150 romance novels, you've read 300 mysteries, you've read all kinds of memoirs, you've read all kinds of girly novels or action novels or spy novels or whatever, and you're ready to go into that genre, don't do it to yourself. It might be where you wind up, but it shouldn't be where you start. Where you start should be with a story that you feel compelled to want to tell. And that should be a mantra for you that you write down somewhere. You're not gonna be the next whomever. You're gonna be yourself and you're gonna tell a story. And where it winds up fitting is an issue that you can face somewhere down the road. All right. Self-promoting won't get you anywhere unless you've got something to promote. So before you get into the business of putting yourself there out there as a writer, as a novelist, as a nonfiction writer, as whatever kind of writer you want to be, don't make a big deal of it until you've got a product. It's like that story about the guy who worked for the same agency I did and went around with a vanity license plate saying he was an author. You know, 
There's a difference between being a hobbyist and being an artist. There's a difference between wanting someone, something, excuse me, and then achieving it. I have read obituaries of people I know where in the telling of their life, it will say something like, and they wrote two novels. What the obituary didn't say is what neither of those novels were published. Now, it would have been fair to say wrote two unpublished novels, but that's not what it said. That's a, sort of a macabre example of what I'm talking about. All right. You have got to have something of value to say. You simply must have something of value to say. And it can't be just simply ordinary. It's got to be special. It's got to be grabbing. It's got to be different. It's got to be compelling. And it's got to exist within the framework of not only the story, but the characters that you create. Now, you may not have a lot of life experience. The article that came out in Pasatempo last Friday about this event focused on my breadth of experience in criminal justice, including law enforcement and all of the other things that I did, corrections and drug abusers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I had basically a quarter of a century apprenticeship that served me well when I got to the point of writing Tularosa, which became the debut novel for the Kevin Kearney series. You might not have that. But what if you were a, a bartender or server? What if you had uh, been a pizza delivery driver? What if you had been a contractor and a builder? What if you had experience in the retail trade or in the financial market? Or you had worked for a, a government agency or you had a career in the State Department or whatever. You have got a reservoir of experience there that you can draw on. And that's great, so you can draw on that. You can create a secondary character who happens to be a server at a, at a fancy bar somewhere. Uh, if you're gonna do that though, let me caution you, make sure you're up to date on that particular career or skill that you're trying to use in your story because Chances are you might not be if it's something that you did 20 or 30 years ago and you're writing a contemporary piece and you're having, for example, a patron at a bar uh, sign a credit card slip when in today's world, you just scribble your name on an iPhone. So you've got to be up to date. You've got to do the research. You've got to do the fact checking all too often writers will let themselves down by not fact checking. And I do it incessantly. And still, when I have a book coming back from my copy editor, I'm caught. They'll say, uh-oh, you blew it on that one. Thank God for copy editors. Uh, as an aside, let me say this, uh, just to reassure you. I have 17 books out. My 18th will go to my editor in April. It's a spinoff, Valerie, not a series. It's a spinoff. And I have yet to write a perfect book. I can't write a perfect book. I have had half a dozen people involved in every book, proofreading it, fact-checking it, copy editing. And it doesn't matter how brilliant my editors are, how good I am at looking at everything, how wonderful a, a copy editor can be. Never have I written a perfect book and I don't think I'm going to. What I try to do is not write books with glaring errors in them. I read a story once about a guy who was, it was a mystery novel and he was traveling across Texas. And as soon as he got to the Texas, Arizona state line, he knew he was home free. Texas, Arizona state line.
Can that pull you out of a story? By the seat of your pants, it can. So fact checking. All right, I'm getting close to the end here. That, that was my point. What you know and you don't know can hurt you. It can hurt you if it's outdated and it can hurt you if you don't learn it and use it the right way in your story. What can you do to help yourself? You can learn to love to rewrite and you can learn to dump the stuff you love. And that may not make any sense to you at all, but I will try to put it in this framework. Some of the absolutely best evocative passages that I've written that just filled me with such pleasure, I have voluntarily cut. Now, why would I do something like that? Because it didn't work. It didn't do anything good. It didn't advance the story. It didn't tell anybody anything that they needed to know. It was just a lovely sentiment that had no purpose and didn't go anywhere. So I think there's a phrase that gets used in creative writing courses about killing your babies or something like that. That's what it's called. Uh, I don't like that phrase very much. So I go with my phrase, which is, sometimes it's best to get rid of the things you love. And if you don't like to rewrite, then I don't think you've really got much of a chance because you should be able to go through everything that you write right up to the day it publishes and see something that could have been done better. I mean, I think that is just the way it is. Now, how do I avoid that once one of my books is published? I don't read them. Simple as that. I have yet to sit down and read from cover to cover anything that I've written that's been published. Now, I, I, because I had a series and I had the trilogy prequel, I had to go back and fact check against myself because I might have had a character that had brown eyes in one novel and in another, I wanted to give them green eyes. Well, somebody would have caught me at that because there are readers out there that are just lying in wait to get you. And I thank them. When they catch me, I thank them. <clears throat> Sometimes I get to catch them. I had one fellow who was a retired uh, Navy guy who in one of my books came back to me and he said, uh -uh, no, no, McGarrity, oh no, no, no. You can't have a flag at half mast on ground. It can only be at half mast on a ship. On land, it's at half staff. And he was right. But I've had other situations where someone said, Winchester never made that rifle ever. And I was able to go back and say, yeah, they made 100 of them. And here's the, here's the citation. So <clears throat> never be afraid to know that you're not going to be a perfect writer. And always be willing to stand corrected. And when you are, thank them for it and show your appreciation because these are people who have taken the time to read what you've written and tell you what they think. And there is really very, very few compliments that can ever go beyond that. So you've heard my spiel. It's gone on for a good half hour. And I think that's probably long enough. So if Vi is willing to move it over to a QA, and a uh, I am too. Let me say this before you do the Q&A. If you're really here because you want to promote your book and you want to talk about it, I understand that. If you could hold that to a minimum 
I think it would be very helpful uh, for the rest of the audience. So with that little proviso, Val, uh, it's back to you, my dear. All right, thank you. Well, I'll start it off with a question from me, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Um, you are, I know, very careful about saying you have 17 published works. I'm wondering if you would be willing to talk about those that didn't get published and how you felt about letting them go. Well, they were my first two manuscripts uh, that I wrote. And in retrospect, even then, early on, uh, they, were, they were bad. And they had, they had no business being anything but rejected. But as I kept writing, I kept getting more positive rejections. You know, you start out and you used to send things over the transom. You could do it directly. You didn't have to have an agent. And so I went to all the publishing houses over the transom submissions. And uh, for the first year or two, they would come back with the standard mimeographed letter, not suitable for our list. And then as I kept rewriting and rewriting, I'd start getting actual notes from real editors telling me that they liked things, but it still wasn't good enough. But I saw that as encouraging. So with the first two books, for me, it was, what did, what did, I, what did I salvage out of the first two books? I salvaged the protagonist for the Kevin Kearney series. That's what came out of those first two books was the fella that wound up being the protagonist in the Kevin Kearney series. So something good came from it. The rest of it was crap. Thank you for sharing that. I think um, that's a hard lesson. And um, like you said, it's part of paying dues and part of preparing to be a professional writer. Um, if somebody has a question, they can unmute themselves and ask Ellen, okay. I see. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. I was just curious um, if a publisher needs to believe that you can write about five good books in order to take a chance on just one. No, I don't think so. Oh, really? Uh, I don't think uh, a, a publisher or even an agent is looking that far ahead when they uh, find a manuscript that captures their interest. Uh, I don't think it's quite that rigid. Mm -hmm. um, there was no question when I started out that my publisher was buying a series. In fact, when Tula Rosa was published, I, was, I just thought like I, I had won uh, an Olympic medal. I had won the brass ring, you know? Mm -hmm. And if I had to go back to work, if I had to keep working, that was okay. I had achieved something I had set out to do. So I don't think there's a, a built-in bias when an agent or a publisher or editor looks at a work and says, where is this going to go down the road? I think they're looking at that story and that story alone for that particular writer at that particular time. Well, thank you. That gives me hope. Good. <laughs> hey, you have your hand raised. Nobody. That's it. I've Burned everybody out. <laughs> no. Had your hand raised? If not. Yeah, there's a fellow who has his okay, hand raised. Okay, Paul, go ahead. You're muted. You have to unmute, Paul. It is on me. Okay. Uh, we, used, we used to sit next to one another in Pronzo in the old days, and we talked at length of several times. But anyway, I just wanted to say that I think you and I are approximately the same age. So if you were to get to your age now and you hadn't published a single book, would you still be averse to self-publishing on, say, Amazon? Yeah, I would. <clears throat> I would, personally. I'm not saying that should be true for everybody, but I doubt that I would want to give up. I mean, there's something Irish about me, and it makes me a little bit pugnastic. And uh, I just, I just... Don't want to ever quit. I, I mean, I've had about five or six careers. And in each and every situation, I have tried my damnedest to excel. 
And in some cases I have and been recognized for that. Uh, so for me, no, I'm, I'm 81 years old. I'll be 82 this year. And if I was still trying to get my great American novel out into the world, I would want to get it out at the highest possible level I, I could. And I wouldn't, I don't think I'd quit. And if that's where you're at, if you've written your great American novel and you really are still convinced that you have an important contribution to make and a great story to tell, don't quit, keep it up. What have you got to lose? Nothing, everything to gain. Thank you, uh, Jeannie. You're muted. You'll have to unmute yourself. I don't. Who's, who's Hi, who's, I, uh, my name's Jenny Cooley, and I'm shopping a book around right now. And um, it's a, it's a novel I've uh, written on two books, and I'm not even getting rejections. I got the person. I did it serious, serious research on what agents and what publishers would be most interested in my book. And, um, and so I've, I've sent out uh, so far say between six and 10 uh, queries. And the person who I was most uh, excited about wrote me back and totally rejected it. And uh, with no explanation, and explanation, and I, um, so I thought about it for a really long time, and I sent her back another letter, and I said, "This, this is why I wrote this, blah blah blah," and I told her exactly what I was thinking. I, I instantly got a response from her, and she said, "Send me your second book as fast as possible," and um, so then that opened a little dialogue, and she said, "You know your characters, blah blah blah." but um, I'm getting discouraged on keep sending out queries because I'm not even getting rejections. <laughs> okay, how many, how many queries have you sent out? You said six or eight or 10 or what? I'm under 10. All right. Uh, what, I, what I do is I keep five out all the time and then I send Why out- Why don't you another... start complaining when you get to 50? Okay? <laughs> start complaining when you get to 50, okay? That's really? a okay. number. So, get and... rejected 50 times before you say you haven't had a, a, a fair shot at breaking through the window. Okay, let me, let me, one little thing on that. Okay, I'm trying to love rewriting. I've rewritten and rewritten, rewritten. So should I A, work on book two, or should I show, go back and rewrite book one again? That, that is your choice and yours alone to make. If you haven't availed yourself of a really good freelance writer, editor, excuse me, if you have been your own editor or if you've been getting your feedback from your writer's group or from your significant no. other, if you're willing to go out into the marketplace and spend some money, and it doesn't have to be a lot. No, I did find that. Find yourself a credible freelance editor and say, take a look at this. Tell me if you think you can work with me. Let me know what I could expect from you and let them have a shot at it. Okay. I have benefited throughout my career by having some of the finest editors in the business on my side. And that has made all the distant difference. So never fear if, you're, if you have the wherewithal to do it and the will to do it, to go out and get some a real professional opinion. It's like if Kim, Kim Shanahan, uh, if I wanted to hire someone to give me expertise about building, I would talk to Kim Shanahan and ask his advice. So well, I, I, I did that and I, and I spent the money on several of them and I got really positive feedback. And um, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going with that okay. at the moment. Okay, good. So keep trying, keep put the book out there in the world, let people, uh, let them decide to do nothing or decide this, to do something. I think it's very positive though, that you got this feedback from this person based on your persistence of going back to them and saying, listen, here's what this story is about. This is why I wrote it. And having her say, send me something to look at. That's good news. You should be Thank proud. you. Okay, thank you. 
on to Kim Shanahan. Well, well, Michael, um, I'm certainly willing to trade advice in your house anytime you want to uh, <laughs> trade some. Um, anyway, uh, Michael, uh, my favorite books of yours were the prequel trilogy. I'm a New Mexico history nut. And so I was hoping you could talk a little bit about the difference in process. Uh, obviously, the story is, is the most important thing. Um, but obviously, uh, especially with those fact checkers, your historical perspective, it must have taken you, uh, you must have had to do some deep dives into uh, the Tula Rosa Basin and the history down there to really be able to pull that off. And you certainly did. Thank you. And, and the other question I've got, Michael, is that if you had come out of the box with the Tula Rosa trilogy before you had ever invented Kevin Kearney, would, it, would you have been, do you believe, able to get it published? And did that trilogy prequel exist in your mind before you even wrote the very first novel of Tula Rosa? <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> I was building up my own personal library of Southwestern history and the Tularosa Basin because I lived down there and I was familiar with a lot of it. And so my library, which you can see a little bit behind me here, has got all sorts of references uh, and all sorts of classics about the Tularosa and its history and everything connected to it. Uh, no, I don't think I could have done the trilogy first. Uh, the story I had to tell was a story of a man coming out of that environment, uh, leaving it, and then being drawn back to it in a certain way. So it was a story about Kevin Kearney's personal history that drew me to that first book, Tula Rosa. Now, let me frame it in a slightly different way. And you might find this a little cuckoo. But I've never really thought of myself as a crime writer or as a mystery writer. I mean, early on, I was talking about avoiding genres, right? Tell the story. What I've been writing about for the last, well, I started writing in 1982. So I have been on this journey now for 40 years. And it only took me, what, 14 years the first 14 years to get into print. And of course I had day jobs, so I had to work and pay the bills and all that. But I've been on this journey for 40 years and I never started out with the idea that I was gonna write crime fiction. What I've done with the 17 books and even the next one, the 18th, uh, is I've been writing a, a, a family saga. I've been writing about one family for 40 years. And they just happen to be called crime novels and historical novels. Uh, but that was never my intent. And so if you, if you have read my body of work, or at least part of it, or are reading it, when you dive back in, take that perspective with you, because that's what I've been doing. And that's really been all along what I wanted to do and what I have intention to do. This next book that I'm finishing up is called The Long Ago, and I love the title. And it's a spinoff to the series because it's about my protagonist's wife's family. Okay? And it takes place right in my wheelhouse of being a young adult in the 1960s. Now, does that mean I have instantaneous clarity on everything from that era? No, I have to fact check it. Like today, I had to look up what the average cost of an office visit to a doctor was in 1965. You want to know what it was? Five bucks. All right. So anyway, I got a little bit off the top, off the topic there, Kim, Kim, but I hope you understand where I was coming from. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Anna S, you are next. Hi, thank you. Um, 
So you, you talked a little bit about your process of getting published for the first time. And I'm wondering if you could go into that a little more, particularly um, how you decided which publishers or maybe agents uh, you wanted to pursue and then how you, I guess, kind of had to perform triage and keep making new choices as your options, you know, as you uh, received rejections and as your options would change or diminish. Well, first of all, let me say that I sold my first two novels without an agent, which is now virtually impossible to do, okay? In terms of how I went about approaching publishing houses, I went to every publishing house I could go to, every one of them. It was HarperCollins, Knopf, Simon & Schuster, Penguin, on and on and on. I, you know, did the research. This was pre-internet days. Go to the library, get the reference books, look them all up, find out who the editors are, what they specialize in, all that sort of stuff and just start sending out query letters, sample chapters, completed manuscripts, the whole thing. And I was just relentless at doing that. Uh, and of course, this was in the day when it all went by post, right? Nothing was done electronically. And so it was taking the manuscript into the, into the, uh, the company that could make the, the copies for me and doing it all that way and going on and on and on. And how it happened was that I caught the attention of a young up and coming editor at a New York house who said, you know, I think you've got some potential. So you're not good enough for me to take to the editorial committee by a long shot, but I'll, I'll tell you what, Whatever you write, I'll look at. And that was like, you will? And that's how it all started. You gotta catch that one person, that one person is gonna give you a look and that can open the door. Does that help? Well, all right, know, yeah. I can't hear you. Thank you for answering that. Um, have you had the same person doing your editing the whole time you've been writing? Mm -hmm. or? Uh, I have used him on a freelance basis ever since then. He left the industry and uh, right up until today, uh, we have a, an, an agreement. It's a, you know, a, a business agreement that uh, he gets to look at everything before I send it in uh, for a, fi a final draft to my uh, publishing house. And it really makes all the difference. And is Mimi your, still your first reader? Absolutely. She'd kill me <laughs> if she wasn't. <laughs> That's great. I'd be dead we, and buried. <laughs> <laughs> we have a question in the chat about, um, well, once you have decided that you have a story to tell and a narrative arc feels stuck, what do you do to get past being stuck? I don't get stuck. There's no reason to get stuck. Uh, when, I'll tell you an old uh, adage that I think is absolutely great that gets bandied around, but I think it's true. If you're thinking, do you think you're stuck? Introduce a new character. You know, see what a new character can do or change perspective. Uh, no, it's, I really only need three things to get going. And they're very idiosync idiosyncratic. I think they apply to me, I don't know whether it apply to anybody else, but I need a working title. And I have to say that I think all but one of my working titles has wound up being the actual title. Uh, I actually keep a list of potential titles. I'll think of a title, I'll run into my uh, laptop and I've got a, a special folder that says book titles and I'll add it, right? I've got a great book title, uh, or a science fiction book that I'll, I'll never write. And it's called The Dark Side of the Moon. It's a great title for a science fiction book, but I don't write science fiction. So I need a title. I need a springboard. Like in my last novel that was published, Head Wounds, which really is about head wounds, once you get into it. It opens with the body of a man found floating in a hotel swimming pool 
in Las Cruces who'd been scalped. That's how the story opens. So, working title, which was head wounds, opening, which was a murder victim scalped floating in a swimming pool in Las Cruces, and finally, the setting. Where, do, where am I going to put this, and how can I make it come to life? Fortunately, I was writing about a part of the state that I knew very well, and I was able to do that. So those are the three things that I, I get going with. You know, whether you're an established writer or not, and you've got a contract, your editor wants to see an outline. And so you do an outline. And the fact of the matter is, I do an outline, and then basically, when I start writing the book, I throw it away. Because it never, it's never going to be what I said it was going to be. And every editor I have had knows that and expects it. You know, what do they expect? Well, for me, they expect a McGarrity story, whatever that is. But so far, it seems that they like what they get. So they keep paying me to do it. I'm spoiled. <laughs> One of the things that you and I talked about last week when we talked was um, that you do have deadlines and you keep them. Um, and I think that's a big part of being a successful writer um, for your own life <laughs> and keeping on track for what uh, other professionals are expecting from you. Um, would you talk a little bit about that? Well, I, I don't really know whether there's any any light that I can shine on that other than, uh, in my case, it's a personality disposition. Uh, I have always been uh, on time. I'm, I'm the guy, you tell me to be at your house at seven o'clock, I'm going to be there at seven o'clock. I'm not going to be there at 20 after, I'm going to be there at seven o'clock. So if I have a deadline or if I've made a commitment, uh, I'm going to meet it. That's just who I am. And you've got to think about it this way, especially if you do have a contract for a book, you've already negotiated your deadline. You and your publisher and your editor have all agreed that this is when the book will come in. All right, so it's, you've kind of made a contractual obligation. And I believe in honoring those kinds of responsibilities. So that to me is like who I am as a person. Now, it's not to say, if a catastrophe hit, would I be unwilling to explain that and ask for more time? Of course I would, of course I would, but I wouldn't feel good about it. Right. We have a couple more minutes for questions. If you're willing to take a, another question or two. Sure. All right, does anybody have anything else they would like to ask? Well, it looks like I've worn everybody out. Oh, um, while we're waiting for shy people to come forward, um, you've talked a lot about the research you've done for your books. And as a librarian, I love to hear about the details of the research you've done and the things you're interested in. Um, do you have any more great stories to share about well, unique a great, items? There's a little can... question down here from somebody. If somebody asked, uh, uh, wrote, uh, do I let my characters go in their own direction? Did you see that? Great question. Yes, great question. Yes, of course. Of course, you can't control everything. You know, I've had characters that I've finally, in, in the series, I've said, I'm just going to kill you because I don't want to ever see you again in another book. So uh, absolutely. Uh, there'll be, uh, especially if you're working with an ensemble cast, which is what I did in the Kearney novels, uh, I had any number of characters that I could surround myself with when I was storytelling, and they would just occasionally pop back up and say, you gotta let me into the story. And I do, of course I do. You know, don't, don't be over rigid. You know, I, there are writers out there that they have to outline every single little thing. And I suppose it works. But on the other hand, it might not. And it certainly wouldn't work for me. And another question from the chat. Do you write longhand or on computer? I started out writing on a big chief tablet. 
and went through about four and a half gallons of whiteout before I was able to afford my first computer. And I have been ever so happy to sit at my keyboard and write on a, a laptop or, or a, a tabletop computer. Uh, no, I do not write in longhand. I do not write everything out. I just sit at the keyboard and I usually have a pretty good idea where I want to go. Sometimes I'll go to sleep at night already thinking about the next scene or what I want to do with the scene that I've written before. Here's a hint. Always go back to the beginning of the chapter that you're working on before you pick up where you've left off. Because it'll give you a continuity, it'll give you a chance to do a really quick edit, and it'll get you sort of motivated to move on to that next bit that you're interested in. Another question, what's the most fun you have in the writing process? What's the most fun? I think the most fun I have is the challenge to always try to be better at what I do. I have this great ambition to excel whatever it is I've put out in the world and do it a little bit better. It's a challenge and I love it. I'm, I'm the kind of person who is more competitive with himself than I am with anybody else. So uh, there are a lot of writers out there and you may have met them at conferences or conventions that they have for writers who are very much uh, impressed with themselves. And uh, I'm not one of those kind of writers. Um, so the co competition I have is uh, self-directed competition. And the fun that I have is being able for the last 26 years, actually make my way comfortably through life writing novels. You know, there aren't many people that get to do that. And I really think I've been having a blast. Another question is about the movie options for your novels. Oh God, I've had so many movie options. I've got a couple that are going out. They're in the, they're in the stratosphere right now. I've got, and, and it hasn't been options, but I've got a very reputable producer who's made major motion pictures and a very reputable screenwriter who has written screenplays for very substantial motion pictures who are collaborating and putting together a screenplay, which sometime soon they're supposed to show me. And the, the minute they do, they have to meet with my agent and offer me a deal. I'm sorry, I'm waiting. But I have had options from almost day one for virtually every book. They've gone absolutely nowhere. And if it happens, it's gonna be fine. And if it doesn't happen, I'm still having fun. <laughs> and another question from the chat, would you be willing to collaborate with a new writer? No, <laughs> no, I would not, I would not. That, would, that is not who I am, it's not what I would do, no. I think that's all the questions we have right now. Um, this has been, such an informative evening and I really thank you for taking the time and generously sharing the things you've learned in your career as a writer um, with so many of us. Well you're welcome and thank you Val for sponsoring this and putting it on. I'm a big fan of the Santa Fe Community College. You already know that I'm a big fan of Val. Uh, I don't know if you know this or not, but I will say that my support for SFCC has gone so far as to help in the establishment of a creative writing scholarship there that's in the name of a dear friend of mine who uh, Santa Fe lost some years ago, who wrote one of the best coming of age books of the 20th century and was a raconteur and one of the funniest guys in town by the name of Richard Bradford. And so the community college has the Richard Bradford Memorial Creative Writing Scholarship. And it was established uh, some years ago. And there are students out there today uh, that are getting their tuition and fees and books paid for uh, 
to study creative writing at, at the community college. And I'm very proud and honored to have something to do with making sure that that's available to them. Thank, thank you. you and thank you for supporting writers and libraries and the writing community. Um, there are so many words of appreciation in the chat for you too. So thank you and have a good evening. Thank you all for coming this evening. Thank you. And I'm going to sign off. So yes. good night. Good night. Good thank night. you.